Hello, I'm Zach Mizell, and thank you to SAM and to you for this opportunity to give this plenary session. I'm going to present the Life Storied Study, Stories for Opioid Risk Reduction in the Emergency Department. This was a comparative effectiveness study of two individualized acute pain treatment communication tools. There are no commercial disclosures. Uh, this study was funded by PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and my time is also funded by the CDC and the NIH. I wish to thank an amazing team who helped make this massive study possible. The team included co-investigators, patient investigators, storytellers, filmmaking team, as well as an advisory board members and uh, large study staff. In particular, this study is dedicated to the memory of Paul Yeber. Paul was one of our storytellers who discussed so candidly his experiences with pain treatment as well as substance use disorder in an effort to help people better understand their risks and make more informed decisions. Tragically, Paul died just weeks after sharing his story for the camera as part of our study. Here is Paul's story. I came down with a condition called peripheral neuropathy that affects the nerves in the hands and the feet. Uh, it especially effect, impacted my feet, uh, very hot, burning, uh, painful, like needles in, in, in the bottoms of my feet. An opiate-based pain medication, Oxycontin, was suggested to me. And at first it worked very well, but I began to abuse it. I had some experience with casual drug use, marijuana, uh, social drinking, even snorted a couple of lines of cocaine somewhere along the line. My mother was an alcoholic, and my father uh, was also an addict. But I was never prepared for the impact of abusing prescription opiates had on my life and the, the dark path that led me down. In the beginning, I thought I, I really had it, and it was okay to take a couple of pills. Even a crush went up and snorted. it. No big deal. You know, I could handle this. What I felt at first was a euphoria and relief turned into a constant state of paranoia that I'd run out of pills or not have the medication nearby so I could take it when, I, when it desired me to take it because it kind of took on a persona of its own. And it, it was just uh, an avalanche after that. Things got worse. I, I would run out of pills and have to search for more and scrounge up money and eventually led me to heroin abuse. I slowly disintegrated, and I didn't realize it. I didn't realize how sinister the process was, how secretive it was, and I lost myself in a slow manner that I didn't even recognize. So I lost my girlfriend, lost my car, lost my house, lost my license, went to prison, destroyed my relationship with my family, and eventually I acquired HIV. Paul's story sets up a key challenge to patients and providers. What are the best ways to communicate opioid risks to patients with pain and align their preferences and values while not exposing them to additional risks? The objectives of the study were to compare the effectiveness of two individualized opioid risk communication tools using, one, a visual display of one's opioid risk misuse, and two, a visual display of one's risk of opioid misuse plus a narrative enhancement video like the one you just saw, and three, a generalized risk communication sheet, which is usual care. At a high level, we sought to compare the effectiveness of these tools on patient-centered and reported outcomes for emergency department patients who present with acute back pain or kidney stone pain. This was a multi-centered randomized clinical trial performed at four geographically diverse emergency department settings. These were our inclusion criteria, and exclusion criteria. This schematic demonstrates our enrollment and data collection protocol. Patients were approached in the emergency department after being evaluated by their treating physician. If they were deemed likely to go home and determined to have back or neck or kidney stone pain, they were then enrolled and randomized to receive one of three interventions, which I will describe next. Baseline data were collected as well as follow-up data on days one through six, then seven, then 14, and again on day 90, using a patient-reported outcome web-based data collection tool called Way to Health. The usual care arm received a standard patient information sheet about their condition. We assessed patients' baseline opioid risk using the previously studied opioid risk tool assessment called 
the Opioid Risk Tool, or the ORT. We then translated that risk into an automated infographic for different risk categories. The infographics leveraged the use of a visual thermometer-like scale and the use of probabilistic communication methods known to be effective in risk communication. It provided basic information about why and how the risks were assessed, as well as some information about options and encouragement to discuss them with a provider. Each participant in the two individualized risk communication uh, communication intervention arms, as well as the treating provider, were shown their risk assessment. Participants in the narrative enhancement arm were shown the probabilistic risk tool and also provided an opportunity to view short, real stories from study partners who described their experiences with pain and pain treatment and sometimes substance use disorder. Not all the stories were about addiction per se, but all involved a description of individual risk, pain treatment, and they all had a narrative arc. Participants in this arm were encouraged to watch at least two video vignettes in the hospital, and they had the option of watching more at home. Pre-specified outcomes assessed were risk awareness and recall, the presence of opioid medication use at day 14, the preferences for opioids upon discharge, and satisfaction with pain treatment one day after the ED visit. 1,302 patients were randomized one to one to one across all three intervention arms. The day 14 response rate was approximately 70% and was equal across all three treatment arms as well. Here are the baseline characteristics. We enrolled about three times as many patients with musculoskeletal pain and back pain compared to renal colic. There was good distribution across gender, race, and ethnicity. Randomization worked well, and there were no significant differences by baseline characteristics across the treatment arms. There were no significant differences by treatment arm in each risk category for opioid risk. Approximately one-fifth of all the enrolled patients were ultimately prescribed opioids in the emergency department. And now for the main results. Recall of opioid misuse risk score was assessed only between the probabilistic and the probabilistic plus narrative enhancement intervention arms. 39% of the participants in the probabilistic arm recalled their risk score and 44% in the probabilistic plus narrative group recalled their risk score at day 14. This difference was not statistically significant. However, we pre-specified that this risk recall effect may be most prevalent among the high and highest risk scoring participants. And indeed, we found a 22% difference between the probabilistic and the narrative arms uh, in terms of recalling their risk in the high and highest risk group. This was statistically significant. Preference for opioids was an additional primary outcome, and here we included the GRC, or usual care arm, in our analysis. 33% of participants who received usual care requested opioids, whereas 28% in the probabilistic and 20% in the narrative arm preferred opioids. These differences were significant even when adjusted for type of condition, as well as opioid risk score and demographic characteristics. Again, here, the narrative enhancement appeared to have the strongest effect in reducing preferences for opioids. By day 14, 11.4% of the participants reported still taking opioids, either from their original ED prescription or a new prescription. Here is the breakdown by treatment arm, with the risk communication arms reporting differences that were not statistically significant. We measured patient satisfaction with pain treatment. This was captured at day one after the emergency department visit. And on a scale of one to 10, uh, in this analysis, the narrative group reported significantly higher satisfaction at 7.3 compared to the probabilistic only in the usual care participants at 
So here are our key takeaways. For patients who present to the emergency department with acute back, neck, or kidney stone pain, there may be some benefits to assessing and showing patients their own individualized risk score for opioid misuse. These benefits manifest in terms of reduced preference for opioid use, patient satisfaction, and recall of their individualized score to two weeks later. We did not see any differences in opioid use at day 14, but the other, among the other effects, there do appear to be uh, differences with the strongest effect being seen among the group that received the narrative or storytelling enhancement. The stories we used were real stories told by patients with complicated and emotional experiences that were shared in a brief online format. There may be future opportunities for these types of interventions for risk communication and shared decision-making scenarios. Please watch and use the stories that our patients shared as part of our study. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Weiler, Professor of Emergency Medicine and Business at the University of Colorado, uh, and I am presenting uh, on behalf of Kirsten Rounds, Becky McGowan, and Jeanette Baird. Uh, our project was entitled Disparities in Gender, Representation, and Salary in Emergency Medicine Leadership Roles. This, this initial data was presented uh, at the Association of Academic Chairs in Emergency Medicine and the Academy of Administrators in Academic Emergency Medicine annual retreat for each of the years that the data was collected, as well as the SAEM annual meetings of each of the includes, included years. We had no financial support and none of the authors have a conflict of interest to disclose. Emergency departments have had a variety of formal leadership roles. This study seeks to determine if there are a gender gap in leadership roles and in the associated salaries of women in those leadership roles. A secondary aim was to determine if there's a gender difference in the domains of roles held by emergency medicine physician leaders. This was a successive cross-sectional observational study of US emergency departments using the Association of Academic Chairs in Emergency Medicine and Academy of Administrators in Academic Emergency Medicine member surveys from 2013, 2015 through 2018. The descriptive statistics are reported and assess differences in gender representation and salary, which was conducted using linear generalized models with rank, years as faculty, region, clinical hours worked, and academic versus community ED as covariance in our model. Separate regression models for male and female salaries across time and leadership roles were also estimated. There were 9,620 responses from 154 academic and community emergency departments. Female emergency physicians represented on average 34.4% of responses per survey year. Across all survey years, the percentage of women in leadership roles was significantly less than men at 44.5%. Women were least represented in executive leadership roles across the five survey years at 9.7% as compared to males. But females were noted to be significantly more represented in educational leadership roles at 18.5% versus 13.7%. Within each leadership role, after adjusting for model covariance, female salaries were significantly less than males. And although salary growth was significant over time for both males and females, females in leadership roles had a significantly lower salary than males at each of the five year time points that the data was reported on. These salary differences averaged across the five years and were $57,150 for executive leadership roles, $27,280 for operational leadership roles, and $19,177 for educational leadership roles. Based on this study, we conclude that across the United States, 
there's a significant lack of women in emergency medicine leadership roles, and in particular, executive leadership positions. We also find that there is a large unexplained salary gap in all leadership domains, which is currently, again, unexplained. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Craig Newgard. I'm an emergency physician at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon, and I am honored and privileged to be able to present our work to you today. I also want to first recognize, uh, support, and thank the many emergency care providers throughout our country and truly throughout the world. So all the physicians, nurses, APPs, techs, medics, and everyone else, thank you for your service and all your care in these last few crazy months. I present to you a national evaluation of emergency department pediatric readiness and outcomes among U.S. trauma centers. I want to recognize my many important co-authors in this work. We are funded by a grant from NICHD. I have no, have no further disclosures. 10 academic medical centers participating, as well as five national organizations and 13 state departments of health. This is truly a large collaborative effort. First, some background. Unintentional injury is a leading cause of death and years of potential life lost in children. Most of these children are cared for in emergency departments. And over a decade ago, the National Pediatric Readiness Program was stood up to measure, understand, and improve the emergency care delivered from EDs, um, and in particular, be able to uh, grade and score the capacity and capability of EDs to provide high quality care for seriously injured and critically ill children. It turns out that there's large variability in this readiness to care for children. And while EDs and trauma centers are assumed to provide comprehensive high quality care, as part of the most sophisticated regionalized model of care in the world, this is not entirely clear that all EDs reach this benchmark. And several important questions persist. Uh, one in particular, it remains unclear whether increased readiness in the ED actually improves quality and health outcomes in our children. This we sought to evaluate the association between ED readiness, mortality, and complications among injured children presenting the EDs in U.S. trauma centers. This is our conceptual model. There is an injury event in which a child is involved. They are transported to the ED. Uh, the readiness of that initial ED is quantified through a national uh, readiness survey. We track children through their hospital course, whether or not they are transferred to another ED or hospital, and then measure health outcomes and quality uh, measures. This we included 44 states from 2012 through 2016, representing 841 trauma centers of a variety of levels, which participate in the National Trauma Data Bank. We match these data to the National ED Pediatric Readiness Survey and focus on children 0 to 17 years with trauma who were admitted, transferred, or died in the hospital due to trauma. We also linked a portion of these records to state vital statistics records. Uh, which were validated in five states. Readiness survey was conducted from 2012 through 2013 in all 50 states and U.S. territories and included 57 questions in six domains. These were created by multiple national organizations and an expert panel to, again, represent multiple aspects of the capability and readiness of caring for children. Um, the answers to these questions are then translated into an overall score uh, called the Weighted Pediatric Readiness Score, which ranges from zero to 100. And this was the primary measure that we evaluated for looking at ED readiness. We collected a number of patient level variables, all which are included in standard risk adjusted models for trauma, as well as several hospital level variables. Primary outcome was in-hospital mortality or serious complication. You can see the complications listed here. For secondary outcomes, we looked at in-hospital mortality and then for a subset of children, mortality out to one year. Our statistical analysis, we use probabilistic linkage to match 
records from the initial ED to a second ED or hospital for those children who were transferred and also to link in state death registries for a subset of states. We looked at key subgroups of children using a variety of definitions of serious injury. And we scored pediatric readiness by quartile at the ED level. We used random effects regression models, which were clustered on the initial ED and several sensitivity analyses to test the rigor of our findings. This is a schematic of our cohort creation. We included any child for whom we had information uh, from the initial ED, including a matched pediatric readiness survey. Uh, the only children that we otherwise excluded were children who arrived with no signs of life. Our total cohort included 312,790 children, uh, which also included just shy of 47,000 children who were transferred to other facilities. Patient characteristics are listed here. There were just under 3% of children who had our composite outcome of either death or complications. The subgroups are listed here. This is a histogram at the ED level uh, measuring quartiles of pediatric readiness. And we can see that there's a fairly large spectrum of readiness across these trauma centers. I will also note that the lowest quartile of readiness, over 30% of these hospitals were level one or level two trauma centers. Panels um, illustrate the unadjusted rate of outcomes on the weighted pediatric readiness scale. So we can see that on the low end of the scale, there's more scatter, um, suggesting a higher rate of complications or uh, in hospital mortality. However, these findings are not adjusted for under some predictors. These panels present findings that are adjusted for those predictors and confounders. These come from our multivariable models and represent the odds ratios of the composite outcome or isolated to in-hospital mortality, looking at uh, different quartiles of readiness compared against um, children who were seen in the lowest quartile of ED readiness. So if I draw your attention to the upper left panel, we can see that for the composite outcome, uh, this suggests um, a lower odds of adverse outcomes. However, the confidence interval just touches one. When we look at mortality, this effect is more statistically conclusive. It would translate into a 42% reduction in the odds of mortality for children seen initially in high readiness EDs compared to low readiness EDs. The other panels look at the variety of subgroups by injury severity. And we can see that these findings are also quite consistent across different subgroups. This slide looks at the different domains of readiness and similar risk adjusted models. And we can see that the personnel domain is the one that stands out as having the strongest association with improved outcomes. Personnel represents the training background and evaluation of providers, both physicians and nurses who staff the ED. One year mortality analysis included just over 40,000 children. We can see in comparing in hospital to one year mortality that there were some children who died following hospital discharge, uh, but prior to one year. And when we run the same models on this subset of children for each of the same groups, there is one subset that stands out uh, that is retaining that beneficial effect uh, in reduction of mortality out to one year um, for the association with being treated in the highest quartile of ED readiness. And those were seriously injured or sorry, seriously uh, brain injured children. Sensitivity analyses are represented here. We can see that for the composite outcome, as we add in trauma center level, pediatric trauma center level and volume, the confidence intervals widen slightly to make these findings less statistically conclusive, but from mortality is uh, very persistent despite adding different hospital level variables. That is the effect of mortality persisted in all the sensitivity analysis. Were limitations in this study, we focus on a higher acuity population that's limited to children with trauma. Uh, 
findings also reflect that of U.S. trauma centers, which may not represent all U.S. EDs. We also focus primarily on in-hospital outcome with a subset of children. For in conclusion, injured children admitted through high red NCDs had lower mortality and possibly lower rates of complications when compared to similar children cared for in low red Translate this more simply, our results demonstrate that uh, the initial care really matters for injured children. These findings support national efforts to raise ED pediatric readiness among U.S. trauma centers that care for children. This might be done by integration of pediatric readiness into national and state level verification programs for U.S. trauma centers. Thank you for your attention. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Allen. I'm an emergency physician and a primary investigator for the STOP CP research study. I'm humbled and honored to be able to present our abstract as an SAM plenary, which is titled, One and Done, Performance of a Single Low High Sensitivity Troponin in a Multi-Site United States Cohort. Some of our pertinent disclosures for this, as you can see, um, some of very renowned researchers in emergency medicine are a part of this study group, and um, they've done research both with industry as well as uh, federal funding. A little bit about the background of, of chest pain. It's no secret to you guys that 15.5 um, million people in the United States suffer from cardiovascular heart disease. And the American Heart Association reports that a heart attack occurs every 41 seconds in the United States. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. And chest pain is among the top reasons for emergency department visits. A little bit more about the background of our study and the uh, primary objective. We used the high sensitivity troponin T assay. This was FDA approved in January of 2017 as the first high sensitivity assay. Now, it's t titled Generation 5 assay by, by the FDA because it did not meet all of the criteria by the IFCC for high sensitivity. However, uh, for this study, we used cut points below the limit of quantification, which is in line with European um, data. So there's a couple of key definitions that are important to know. And the limit of quantification is the, is the lowest number that's able to be recorded uh, for, for, for the uh, assay. The limit of detection is the lowest number that's able to be seen by the analyzer. And for this study, we use the limit of quantification, or the LOQ. Furthermore, starting as early as 2010, Europe uh, data suggests that a single high sensitivity troponin result below the limit of detection excludes major adverse cardiac events or MACE in patients with symptoms concerning for acute coronary syndrome. However, the United States and the FDA limits high sensitivity troponin numbers to the limit of quantification, and there's a paucity of U.S. data and lack of multi-center data in the United States to support any um, practice change based off of that. So this goes to our study objective. The objective of this study is to test the diagnostic performance of an initial high sensitivity cardiac troponin T measure below the LOQ in a multi-site U.S. cohort. Can we answer this, the question of high sensitivity troponin, one test and safe for discharge or done? A little bit about the, the overall STOP CP study. You guys have probably been wondering what STOP CP stands for. Well, my co primary investigator, Dr. Simon Mahler, coined the term based on the acronym High Sensitivity Cardiac Troponin T to Optimize Chest Pain, STOP CP. So, for this study, we had a prospective ob observational cohort group, and we looked at eight sites across the United States. And the patients were assessed based on the chest pain or symptoms suggestive of acute coronary syndrome. It lasted from late January 2017 to early September 2018. Here's our map of the uh, respective sites across the country. As you can see, the uh, Midwest was um, not present on our um, enrollment sites because the sites that we approached were already on the high sensitivity troponin T, which excluded them from being an enrolling site. Our study inclusion and exclusion are, are quite basic for uh, cardiac biomarkers research, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, exclusion criteria of STEMI, of course, shock, 
and um, lack of capacity to, to consent and uh, lack of follow-up. I think it's important to describe how we ran the Stop CP study so then we can get into the actual abstract data of the um, one and done strategy and the assessment of its performance. So for Stop CP, we had an ED arrival and if they met inclusion criteria after screening, they were enrolled. Well, one of the challenges is, is that the respective sites were blinded to the high sensitivity troponin result. So we went with the contemporary assay of those respective sites and we tried to get the enrollment or high sensitivity assay for the study as close to the contemporary assay as possible. And we gave ourselves a window of one hour. We did serial troponins for the study at zero, one, two, and three hours. But in respect to this uh, plenary presentation, we're gonna focus on the first or time zero. After the uh, initial blood draws in the index visit, which was reviewed, the providers at the bedside were asked to fill out a treating provider survey, which gave us information about clinical decision rule data, as well as the uh, onset, quality, and character of uh, someone's chest pain if it was indeed present. Following that, they had a follow-up review with a phone call and medical record review. It's also really important to point out how we got to our outcomes, and this is through adjudication. We used both cardiologists and emergency physicians to review the cases of these patients with the contemporary assay as well as the high sensitivity troponin with the primary outcome of MACE or major adverse cardiac event at 30 days. This was um, also with the secondary outcome of cardiac related death or MI. The cardiac related death was based off of the ACCORD trial definition and cardiac revascularization was based off of a cabbage or PCI. It's also important to point out that we use the fourth universal definition of MI, which helped the adjudicators differentiate from a type one and type two myocardial infarction, which was a part of their study definitions and guidelines. The statistical analysis for this plenary abstract is that we use basic statistics of negative predictive value and sensitivity with exact 95% confidence intervals. For the overall stop CP study, we enrolled nearly 1600 patients. And we excluded about 120, and those were mostly secondary to lack of a second troponin at the study site, or that we couldn't get them um, in a timely manner. The patients eligible for analysis for stop CP was 1,462, and we only lost 64 to follow up, or, or a little under 5%. The primary outcome of 30-day MACE was included in 14.4% of this group, and in comparison to other U.S. studies, our event rate is actually higher and in line with what European studies have cited in the past. Instead of a big, busy table, we decided to come up with bullet points for what are the study characteristics of the larger STOP CP study in those over 1,400 patients. Well, 46.3% of them were women, 37.1% were African American, and the mean age was almost 58 years old with a standard deviation of nearly 13 years. In regards to this abstract, we wanted to look at the distribution for the patients under the limit of quantification. And as you can see from these numbers in the pie chart, a third of the group from the, from the larger STOP CP study were included in where their first troponin was under the limit of quantification. This is not insignificant. And for that group, we found that they're likely to be female, younger, and more likely to be Hispanic or Latino, which was statistically significant. Okay, now, so now let's talk about the performance of the assay at, the, at or below the LOQ. So on this bar graph here that you see, black is the 30-day MACE, and red is the death or MI at 30 days. The negative predictive value for 30-day MACE was 98.3%, under 99%. And... For death and MI, the, the negative predicted value was right at 99%, but the confidence interval, the tail, looks to be lower than that. And for the sensitivity, they're both under 98% or 99%, respectively. Shown in a different manner, the dotted line on this graph is the LOQ for the United States for high sensitivity troponin T at 6. What this actually shows is that under 6, we likely have a very safe assay with with a true 99% negative predictive value for both MACE and death or MI. However, as stated earlier, the FDA will not allow us to report under six 
at this time. But for stop CP, we recorded down to three. So that's how we have this data here where it looks like the actual sweet spot of safety is at four or less. All studies have some limitations. Some people may consider these strengths, maybe weaknesses. One is that sites were mostly urban academic centers. Our cohort had a higher MACE or event rate than, than many prior US studies. Our loss to follow up was only 4%, which in most studies it's 10% or more. We, th we see this as a strength. However, for those 64 patients that were lost to follow up, we don't know their event rate. So that has to be in consideration as a limitation. And also we only utilize the Roche high sensitivity troponin T assay. This was not a comparative study with other uh, assays, including uh, high sensitivity troponin I. In conclusion, use of a single high sensitivity cardiac troponin T measure below the LOQ may not be sufficient to rule out 30 day MACE and had insufficient sensitivity for 30 day cardiac death or MI. I think what this shows is that we probably need to mirror what Europe has done and report down to the limit of detection if possible, where I think we have a safer safety profile, which would also lend itself to what the European Society of Cardiology guidelines suggest. This study has many people who need to be acknowledged for, for their efforts. First and foremost is the University of Florida as the coordinating center and primary site. Couldn't have been done without the great research coordinators and team we have here. My, my co-primary investigator at Wake Forest, Simon Mahler, as well as our great site PIs, Dr. Rob Christensen, who did the central lab and all the analysis, Dr. Troy Madsen at University of Utah, Dr. Bryn Mama at UC Davis, Dr. Richard Nowak at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, and Dr. Gentry Wilkerson at University of Maryland. Also, this study wouldn't be possible with the data without our data manager, Scott Cohen, and our biostatisticians, Dr. Michael Weaver and Kai Yang. And lastly, I really want to thank the fellow emergency physicians in the midst of this pandemic and COVID-19. You guys may have thought that this is actually a pocket square, but it's my surgical mask when I have to walk back across to my office. And we've all had great sacrifices in the midst of this. I really hope that in the future, we could do this in person and have the camaraderie and scholarship that SAM is all about. Thank you.